a venture. Let me give you the uh, definition according to Webster. It says, an unusual and exciting, typically hazardous experience or activity with an element of unknown. Tonga, South Pacific, 1984. I went on the beach, I saw two guys, and they said, let's go spear fishing. So we take the boat out about a mile and a half to the reef, jump in the water, get some fish, come back, and they say, no, hey, if you want to go back tomorrow, come on down. If you are not here, take the boat and go out anyways. So the next day I go, I look for the guys, didn't see them. So I said, okay, I guess I'm going to go out. That boat was heavy, and now the tide is out, so it's 50 meters or 50 yards from the water line because the tide receding and uh, I cannot do it by myself so I see this one girl she's built like a tank about 15 years old so I said okay she's collecting shells and hey give me a hand so we bring the boat to the water and then I said no, hey do you mind to come with me over to the reef and she said I've never been on a boat and I said no it's okay well as long as we come back before sunset because otherwise I'm going to be in trouble and I look at the clock and say, oh, we got four hours, piece of cake, you know. So we go, we get out there, I get a rope around my waist, you know, so I can drag the boat and her, you know, in it. <laughs> so I'm looking around, you know, for fish, and then all of a sudden, rain starts pouring like crazy. And I could tell that she was miserable on the boat, you know, sitting there, kind of shivering, you know, <laughs> with all this rain. To me, it didn't make a difference. I'm in the water. But I felt, yeah, this is not good. So I jump on the boat. And all of a sudden, we couldn't see squat. I mean, the visibility was maybe 10 to 15 feet max. So I didn't, I didn't even know where to row. So I started kind of rowing toward what I thought was land. And about 30 minutes later, we come across this little island. We decided to, uh, to kind of stay there and let the weather pass by. So we went inside of this trunk, you know, a hollow trunk, and waited for a while. And it's starting to get darker and darker. And I can see that she's worried. So all of a sudden, you know, the, water, the uh, rain stops, and I start seeing some lights on shore. So I thought, okay, that's shore. So we get on, we go. As we approach, I hear this voice of a woman calling the girl's name. I'm going, oh, this is not good. So I said, no, hey, listen, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come and, uh, and talk to your family about what happened. So we get on shore, meet the mother, you know, she's all worried. And I said, no, I'm coming to your house so I can talk to your husband about what happened. And uh, she said, well, that's a good thing. Otherwise, he's going to beat both of us. <laughs> I'm going, oh, shoot, this is not good. And, and this gal, she was what they defined themselves as a half-breed, half-Indian, half-Tongan. So I didn't know what to expect at home. You know, I mean, I was 23 years old, you know, in good shape, but I didn't know what was at the other end, right? So I, I get to the house, I get in, and uh, it's one big room, six, seven hundred square feet, and it's divided by some curtains because there is a main family and then the family of, of the son. And here's this man, 250 pounds, sitting down at the table, you know, just kind of staring at the table. So I go in and I... I start telling him, I say, no, hey, this is what happened. Um, I am, uh, you know, a fisherman. I took your girl, you know, we went out, we did this and that. And the guy's just standing at the table. He's not saying a word. And, um, and I thought, shoot, my life as a single is over. <laughs> this is my future bride right here. <laughs> and uh, kind of a homely girl, poor girl. But anyway, so... <laughs> All of a sudden, you know, I, I finish my story and, uh, and the man just pounds his palm on the table, gets up and goes, good American boy, you had the balls to come over here and tell me what happened. Sit down and have some tea. <laughs> you know, I was off the hook. <laughs> that, that was a flash forward here now, about five years ago, decided to buy a little inflatable boat and uh, we do a maiden voyage, you know, my son and I, Marco in the back. Hey, thank you for the food, Marco. Appreciate it, buddy. So, so we are in this 16-foot uh, rubber boat, and uh, we take it to the Tennessee River, you know, just to test a few things. Okay, good. We are, we, are, we are set. So we take off one day, early morning. We get down to Venice, Louisiana. Some of you might know where that place is. Probably, John, you know where that is. So we go down there and uh, we start heading out. 
you know, start heading out down the Mississippi River. We get to the uh, front of the ocean and head out to the first rig. The water is brown. You know, we spearfish, so we're not there with this, right? We have to go under, so we need to see. Water's brown. So we go to the second rig, and uh, second rig, the water's still pretty bad. So we decide, okay, let's make it to the third rig. And we get there, and the water is maybe beige color, so not quite what we wanted. So since we didn't have any other fishing line or, or you know, fishing pool, we said, okay, Hail Mary, let's go to the floating dock, which is about 40 miles out. So we get out there, and typically people, when they go out there, they take pictures of the platform, you know, with the workers and everything. You should have seen it. The workers were taking pictures of us. <laughs> I said, now, who are these two nuts on, uh, on a single engine bathtub, you know, doing 40, 40 miles out here? You know? we're, we're just insane. So, you know, we're going, oh man, the water's still bad, you know, let, let's get back. So we start heading back, and uh, as we're approaching the, uh, the front of the Mississippi River, you know, the water is, is rushing against us, and there is this big ship that is going up loaded with containers. And the wake that was making was maybe 12, 15 feet high. I mean, it was pretty impressive. So we passed that boat, that ship, you know, we keep going up, and now it's getting dark. So Marco is turning on the lights. There are no lights. And I'm going, oops, <laughs> this is not good. So as we continue to go up, you know, we, uh, we're getting you know, into this darker and darker uh, environment and the boat is still tagging behind us, and all of a sudden, the engine quits. Man, I never prayed so hard in my life. I was like, okay, Lord, you know, please get, get this thing going again. Marcus said, no, what, what is the flare gun? What is the flare gun? I said, I don't know. So he's looking in the box, and the ship is gaining on us and doesn't see us. I mean, it's pitch dark. And I'm thinking, okay, even if we jump off board, Probably, you know, the current is going to take us against the boat and then we're going to go all the way to the back of the boat and then the engine are going to make ragu sauce out of us. I mean, that's, <laughs> that, that, that's it. You know, so I'm turning the key again and all of a sudden, you know, the engine kicks in. So we cut a 90 degree just like a James Bond, you know, with maybe 50 feet from the boat, get to the shore, start putzing up again and the engine quits a second time. But at least now we are close to the shore. So try one more time, it starts again, you make a bend, and the engine dies. And we're about four or five miles still from, from the dock. Within a couple of minutes, some spotlights come on, and we are hearing this loudspeaker. You guys okay? I'm going, no, I mean, we're shivering, and we're getting cold. It's the Coast Guard. So the guy says, hey, do you have any weapon on board? I said, no, no, just spear guns. So I'm gonna board you, so he, got, he comes on gets the boat attached to their yacht, and uh, you know, they invite us in, they give us a blanket, and Marco goes, ooh, are we gonna get hot chocolate too? <laughs> and I go, yeah, you're gonna get a massage as well, you know, come on, you know? <laughs> so, so we're sitting there, you know, and, uh, and they take us to, uh, to our dock, they check for documents and everything, and everything was okay, and, and they leave, and, and the boat from that day on was called Lazarus. So, <laughs> A couple of stories about, you know, adventure, and, and, and I think with Marco the other day we were talking and, and we identified that we made our guardian angels work over time probably about seven times when they pulled us, both of us, alive out of situations. But, but those are things in my mind that are honestly irreplaceable, memories that are irreplaceable. And you see, the fear of death does not prevent you from dying, but often prevents you from living a full life. At least that's the way I interpret life. It's a bit of a crazy mindset, but it's a mindset that made me do some extreme things even when extreme sport, the word wasn't even invented yet. Pastor Tim was talking about that venture, you know, when I was 15 years old, and it's crazy. I mean, how many 15 years old say, now I want to challenge myself and, and swim for 24 hours? The Federation actually didn't want me to do it because I was too young. I was looking for uh, pushing the limits, right? And uh, I stared at this black line back and forth in a 50-meter pool, 
water 95 degrees so your flesh is starting to come off because it's cooked and lost about 17 pounds in the, in the process, just in 24 hours, and set the world record at 83.7 kilometers, which is 52 miles. And that also got me two years later to do a, a swim from Monte Carlo to Genova. And that's a trekking of uh, 180K, so it's about 115 miles, uh, six hours on, two hours off. West suits that are terrible back in those days, this is 1977. You know, they are diving suits, they are not made for triathlons or anything. So every time you're taking a stroke, you know, the suit is fighting against you. Then you're peeing inside, so you got urine and salt, you know, just cutting up your armpits. So every time you're taking a stroke, you know, you're in pain. I mean, it's just not. How far can you push it, you know? And more recently, I was the U.S. team captain at the World Cup for free diving. And uh, free diving is not you dive in the air freely, <laughs> no, no. You actually go underwater and see how far you can go and still come back alive. You know, that's basically the objective of it. And, and the doctor used to say that, you know, the limit was about 30 meters, which is 98 feet for the humans. And in that occasion, I set a national record at 168 feet. So all kind of crazy thing, and you ask him, Peppo, why, why all these things that are so extreme? And I think initially with me was, was just, again, the self-challenge. And that was kind of my mantra die before you quit. I grew up with that, it's still in my mind, and it resonated a lot when I was training the SEALs for four years in the early 90s down in, uh, in Coronado. But afterward, it became almost a hazard. It became, in a sense, destructive, just like drugs to the addict. Why is that? Because those accomplishments started to define who I was. And that is dangerous. And I know that Pastor Tim has been doing this series on sanctification, you know, you see that clean. And I was trying to figure out, okay, what is the intersection between adventure and sanctification? And I think that intersection lies with one question. What or who defines you? Typically, we define ourselves by our strength, whether it is athletics, whether it's academics, whether it's possession, whether it's things that you have accumulated, work hard for, business acumen, artistic gifting, looks, or even a beautiful wife, right? That, that kind of gives you a sense of strength. But that also tends to inflate your self-image. But also the world or yourself can be defined by weaknesses as well. So that results in a deflated view of self. Both of them are dangerous because on one side, what you're going to have, you're going to have arrogance and pride. And on the other side, you're going to have depression and a maybe suicide spirit. And the problem is when you're active, the moment you start seizing, producing, you stop doing what you're doing, you stop being. And that's very dangerous because you become a has-been. The moment your last competition ends, the moment you sign your last deal, the moment injury takes you out, that's a, a tough one because I was training for 84 <clears throat> for Los Angeles, the Olympics, and I broke my back January of 83. <clears throat> it was a beautiful lesson, beautiful lesson because the Lord says, Plepo, your feet are firmly planted in me there, they're not planted on me. So it was a great lesson, but there is still that sense of, that was my last dream, and you took it away. So when your last uh, game is over, you start feeling like, well, I used to be so-and-so, I used to do such and such, and now I'm no more, and that's a huge lie. Paul, <clears throat> Paul had to lo a lot to boast about, right? He had a wonderful background, and from time to time, he would bring up those, those accolades to establish a platform, a platform where he could proclaim Christ. But yet, he looked at all of these things that he considered those things trash in comparison to what? To knowing Christ intimately. So can I say the same thing? Can I say that all the accolades, whatever I've accumulated, it cost me a lot, 
something that the world esteems so much and values so much? Can I say that is trash, that is all for nothing? Honestly, it's hard. I've given it up, I'm giving it up. It's a, it's a working process. I'm trying to free myself from that. And I think that true identity starts with a question. God, Father, who do you say that I am? I think we all crave validation, but if you're trying to get the validation from the world, it's a black hole. It's conditional. Please, don't go there. It's deadly. I think that it's much better if we believe and if we affirm what our Heavenly Father tells us that we are. Try to listen to just, just few words, but listen with your heart. Don't listen with your ears. You know, go beyond my accent and everything. This is what your Father tells you that you are. You're my beloved. You're my son. You're precious to me. You're my warrior. You are redeemed. You are forgiven. You are mine. And you are worth dying for. This is huge. <clears throat> there are a lot of accidents that happen in this world, and you are not one of them. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And maybe this is the path towards sanctification and a lifelong adventure, discovering what good works God has prepared for you. At some time, I think that in the eagerness to do something, we start walking down the wrong path. And that can bring discouragement. If you are a fish, don't try to crawl on land just because you saw a crab that is doing it. Just enjoy the water. Let it rush through your scale, right? Or if you are an eagle, don't try to be like the trout and go underwater <laughs> because you're meant to soar high. So let the air just go through your feathers. Enjoy who you're made to be. I think similarly as children of God, we ought to be full with the fullness of God, not just cultural or traditional things because that will bring disappointment. We leave us wanting. And I wanted to read a quote. I don't remember what I read this a long, long time ago, but it's so spot on. It says, what will keep you serving the Lord when the going gets tough? You may be sensitive to the needs of others, but that alone is not enough. Nor should we be driven by the need that we have a desire to be appreciated or loved by others. Our needs are deep, and only God can satisfy them. The more we try to satisfy them with anything else, even God's work, the more dissatisfied we will become. In short, even love for God's people, His sheep, won't keep us going because sheep can often be unlovable, and we may come to resent them. It's a beautiful, beautiful quote, and it reminds me of a, of a situation. One time in Rome, years back, we organized this event. I invited the U.S. ambassador to come and speak, and then I made some comments and an invitation to receive Christ afterward. And, and then I had to do some follow-up on some people that committed their life to Christ. And so this one day, I had an appointment at this one hotel, so I'm driving there, and on the way to the hotel, you know, small roads, you know, cars park, I'm looking for a parking spot, 
and uh, all of a sudden there is a motorcycle behind me tailgating me and you know start honking you know and I kind of wave you know get around me you know you have plenty of room so we go down a little more and he's still honking and honking I said what's the matter with this guy so I get to the stop sign comes right up and start yelling and screaming oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. so I lower the window and I start yelling and screaming at him right <laughs> I mean that's Italian so yeah, yeah. you know we're both going back and forth and here comes this, this taxi and stops you know right in front of the hotel and out of the cab comes this guy that looks very much like the guy that I'm supposed to meet and I'm in the middle of yelling and screaming with this fella I'm going hmm <laughs> so turn the corner park the car I'm sitting there and the lower conviction, right? So he goes, Peppo, in five minutes, you're gonna go inside there and you're gonna talk to that man about the love of Christ. <laughs> what in the world are you doing? <laughs> and, and, and that's our nature. It's such a challenge because now is not much different. I mean, this was a few years back, but uh, right now we're going through a through Ephesians, the book of Ephesians, beautiful book. So every Sunday I do Zoom with Italian at the distance. So we're still doing meetings with Italy, but electronically. I'm looking at chapter three of Ephesians when Paul is down on his knees. That's how much he cares for the Ephesians. You know, right before he left Ephesus in Acts 20, he does the same thing. He's down on his knees praying for them. And what is he praying for? That they will come to know the love that surpasses knowledge that they will understand how deeply rooted that love is. And I'm going, whoa, 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 whoa. I guess I'm not quite there yet. So I was challenging the people back home about receiving that love and then putting it forth to others around us, even those they're hard to love. That's a huge challenge. So I said, okay, guys, let's see how the Lord will do this for us during the week. So Monday morning, get off, get to the YMCA, first thing in the morning with my wife, Get in there, no mask, and you know, this little girl comes up, hey, what is your mask? I'm saying, I don't have a mask. Well, you need a mask. And I'm saying, oh, listen, I, I tested, I had COVID, I have antibodies, I cannot catch it, I cannot give it. Why should I use a mask? You gotta have a mask, you gotta have a mask. So, you know, I start getting frustrated, then I think, okay, well, I better go and get the mask in the car, you know. And then my wife, sweet, sweet Jane, I mean, she, she, she's a diamond. Right, Marco? <laughs> she's a diamond. She said, Peppo, how do you think that woman is going to look at you? Is she going to say, oh, what a nice, lovable guy? Or is she going to say, look at that pain in the neck, you know? And that's the way sometimes, you know, unfortunately, we do, we do come across. So the, the spoiler alert on that is that the process of sanctification, guys, is not going to be completed until we are six feet under. Sorry to tell you that. But it's a process, so we've got to strive for that, definitely. So I think that um, the biggest adventure in life probably starts when, when you come to a place of holy unrest, like it happened to me back 20 years ago, and you say from the bottom of your heart, here I am, Lord, <laughs> use me. As you see fit.